In the previous video, we studied the hazard pointer algorithms in order to safely reclaim the memories in the concurrent data structures. In this video, we are going to study uh, safe memory reclamation for concurrent data structures, but we are going to study on what is called epoch-based reclamation algorithm for this SMR problem. So recall that hazard pointers has a few shortcomings. First, it is difficult to use. Each API is a little bit difficult to use. And the second is that it is not fast due to the fences for each iteration. And third, it doesn't support a few or unuseful synchronization patterns in the uh, concurrent programming. For example, the chain retirement is not supported in header pointers. This EBR, or epoch-based reclamation, is trying to solve all of the problems. So it is fast, it is, it is supporting the uh, chain retirement and other patterns, and also each API is a little bit easy to use. So all the homework on implementing concurrent data structures will be, will be using this EBR uh, rather than hazard pointers or other uh, schemes in this course. Okay, let me explain EBR in a little bit more details. So recall that all SMR algorithms need to answer two questions. And the first question is, how do I protect B from being freed uh, from the access point of view? And the second uh, question is, when is it safe to free the B uh, from the uh, modifier's perspective? So these two aspects are synchronizing with each other and if it is uh, correctly done we can safely reclaim the memories after all the accesses are finished so so this is the in order to answer the first question in order to protect b so the thread is calling on what is called set active function so in ebr this set active function is protecting all the pointers that I'm going to access from now on. In that sense, it is a blanket protection. It is not protecting a single pointer, but instead it's trying to protect all the pointers that it is going to use uh, from, from now on. So this is illustrating what's going on here. So it is uh, protecting all the threads, uh, I mean all the pointers uh, by calling set active uh, by the thread one, and since it is protecting protecting every pointers, you can safely iterate through all the blocks. So you can iterate to B zero from the head pointer because it is protected by this blanket protection of a set active function, and you can also travel to the next pointer without worrying about safety because B one is also protected by the blanket protection and B2 as well. So far so good. So it is protecting all the pointers at the same time. And you can immediately see that why this is, say, uh, this is fast. The reason why this is fast is that we don't issue the, the, the fences, expensive fences for each iteration. We may have to issue fences at the beginning of the set active, but after calling the set active, the I trading through all the nodes inside this linked list, uh, they doesn't incur uh, the uh, cost. On the other hand, the uh, the from the modifier's perspective, after, uh, for example, detaching B from the data structure, it needs to call the free function for this block B. And when is it safe to do so? <coughs> when uh, the, the, the answer is that if B cannot be accessed by any active threads, uh, so let's say that a thread is in active state if it is calling, uh, it has called set active. So if no active state, I mean no active threads are accessing B, then we can, it is quite true that B is no longer protected by anyone, so we can safely deallocate the block B. So suppose that T1 just uh, removed the two blocks, B0 and B1, from the linked list by uh, updating the head pointer from B0 to B2. And 
it it may call retire function because b0 and b1 are detached from the linked list so it is it must be deallocated later so for now we are just marking that oh these nodes are retired so please please uh, deallocate them at the later stage of execution so first that's good and now the collect function uh, wants to deallocate uh, those uh, those that are retired but it is not protected for now it is uh, there is no such uh, pointers because uh, even though b0 and b1 are retired they are protected by the t1's active state they are protected in a blanket manner so it it, it the t1 doesn't specifically protect b0 and b1 it just protects every pointers it is going to access so that's the reason why specifically B0 and B1 uh, will be protected. So that is basically the, uh, what's going on here. And now, after T1 finishes the, uh, ex the, the iteration of this linked list, it is calling set percent function. So let's say this is an opposite of set active. So it is, it is finishing the active state of the thread. It signifies the fact that T1 is no longer accessing the blocks. So that is basically the meaning of set crescent. It is uh, synonymous to set inactive, and it is finishing the ongoing active state, and say that it is not going to access the shared memory blocks. After set crescent is called, uh, the collect function may free v0 and v1 because they are retired and they are no longer protected by T1 anymore because T1 already called set crescent. Uh, that means that uh, it doesn't protect all the, th all the pointers in a blanket manner. And in particular, B0 and B1 are no longer protected. So as a result, a collect function uh, may safely deallocate or free those two pointers, B0 and B1. Okay. As I said before, it is fast because inside T1 site iteration, it doesn't need to call the expensive fence all the time. So each iteration doesn't incur any synchronization fences because already all the pointers are protected in a blanket manner. So you don't need to protect more pointers at this point of time. Furthermore, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, in more details, uh, you, you may need to issue a fence when the set active function is called, but after the set active function is called, you don't know, you don't need to uh, issue additional fences in each iteration. The second benefit is that it is widely applicable, and in particular, it is applicable to the change retirement uh, synchronization pattern. So, if, as we saw in a previous example, uh, even though B0 and B1 are retired at once, we can safely uh, iterate uh, T1 is safely iterating through T B0, B1, and B2, on and on, uh, because B1 is also protected by the set active function. And as a result, even though B1 is not traversed yet by T1, it is not going to be deallocated by uh, the t2 or the collect function that's the reason why it is safe for t1 to iterate through this uh, chain, reti chain retired nodes so including the chain retirement patterns uh, or ma many other patterns uh, that you can think of in concurrent data structure iteration or traversal uh, they are protected by the the epoch based reclamation and at the high level, the reason is it protects all the point potential accesses uh, in a blanket protection. That's the reason why it is uh, widely applicable to many concurrent data structures. And furthermore, it is easy to use, easier to use than header pointers. And let me explain that in another video when I will explain uh, the API of the CrossBeam epoch, which is an implementation of this EBR uh, 
algorithm. So far so good. And now we need to uh, answer a, in a little bit deeper way how T2 or the other threads uh, can deduce that B cannot be accessed by any active state. So how to decide that? I just said that T2 or a collect function needs to decide whether B can be cannot be accessed by any active state, but it somehow needs some algorithm. You cannot know that from out of the nowhere. You need to somehow deduce this information by observing the other threat's behaviors. How to do that? That is the question I'd like to answer in the next slide. So the high-level idea of this uh, epoch-based reclamation and synchronization is the epoch consensus. So epoch consensus means that, uh, first of all, each thread is uh, marking where it is going to where it is going to start accessing the concurrent uh, blocks and where it is going to finish accessing uh, the concurrent blocks and it is called set active and set crescent as we saw in the previous slides so uh, only after set active function is called t1 may be able to access the shared memory locations and after set crescent is called it no longer has it, it should not have the pointers to the shared memory any longer. So this marks the range in which the concurrent data structures are accessed. And you cannot save the pointers to the concurrent nodes in a previous active state and use it in a later active state. So in that sense, the active states are completely separable. And, and pointers are not going to be shared among multiple active states inside the same thread and the other threads. So far so good. And furthermore, each active state, uh, that is um, uh, the range between these set active and sequestrant invocations, they are annotated with an epoch. Epoch is basically meaning a timestamp. Uh, so it is a natural number for example, 10 or 11 or 100. So it is a natural number uh, that uh, begins from zero. And each active state is annotated with an epoch. So it is assigned automatically by the algorithm. So you don't need to worry much about uh, how to assign them. But if you want to actually implement this epoch-based reclamation, you need to somehow come up with an algorithm that determine the epoch of a new active state. But anyway, at this point of time, let's assume that epochs are just assigned for each active state. And furthermore, the final rule and the, the most important rule is this epoch consensus rule, uh, which is that concurrent epochs, uh, epochs of the concurrent active states, they may differ only by one. So for example, uh, these T1's active state and T2's active state are overlapping and they are concurrent because there is a time at which T1 and T2 are executing at the same time. I mean, their active states are executing at the same time. Therefore, T1's active state here and T2's active state here should differ by at most one. It should, it should not differ two or three or bigger. So T2's epoch must be either E or E plus 1. So that's the, the consensus rule we are going to have for each active state. And furthermore, T3 must be E or E plus 1 because T1's active state is overlapping with T3's active state. And they should differ by M plus 1. And so it can be E plus 1, for example. It cannot be plus two, however. On the other hand, T2's next active state, it can be annotated with E plus two because there is no concurrent thread or no concurrent active state uh, that is annotated with epoch E. So it, the epoch may advance to E plus two at this point of time. And T4, it is going to be, it 
can be annotated with plus 3 for the same reason. There is no concurrent active state uh, that is assigned with the plus 1 epoch. So the first part of the algorithm, this, the first part of this epoch-based reclamation algorithm is actually assigning epochs to each active state. That satisfies this epoch consensus rule. Concurrent epochs or epochs of concurrent active states may differ by n must 1. So that is the golden rule of epoch-based reclamation. And without this, we cannot guarantee the safety of the, uh, the algorithms. So it is at the heart of the safety of this epoch-based reclamation algorithm. And now, after observing this consensus rule, the, it is very easy to answer the question 2. When is it safe to free block, uh, the block B? So suppose that the block B is uh, retired in an active state with epoch E, for example, in this active state. So, so by assumption, we have to make sure that all the concurrent data, uh, concurrent memory blocks will be in accessed inside the active state. And as a result, this, uh, this block B must be detached from the data structure and retired in the same active state with an epoch, for example, say E. So far, so good. And the answer to this question too, when is it safe to block free B is at an epoch E plus 3. So it is very simple. If it is retired at epoch E, then it can be freed at epoch E plus 3. So E plus 3 is a little bit magical in the sense that 3 comes from nowhere. But you can, I can, I can, I can explain why E plus 3 is actually safe using this diagram. So in epoch E plus 1 or earlier, in an epoch E or E plus 1, you can still reference the block B. Because the, the fact that B is removed from the data structure or detached from the data structure, this information has not yet been uh, propagated to T2 or T3. It may be possible that even though T1 already removed the block B from the concurrent data structure, T2 or T3 may be uh, referenced the block B because T, uh, this, uh, these active states are overlapping. And as a result, it may be possible that T2 and T3 may get the pointer to block B before it is removed from the uh, concurrent data structure. However, in an active state that is annotated with E plus 2, it must not be the case uh, because this T1's active state <coughs> must happen strictly before E plus 2. So, so by the epoch consensus rule, this T1's active state and T2's second active state must not overlap with each other. In other words, uh, the T1's end or set question function is strictly happening before the T2's um, beginning of this epoch active state uh, by th the invocation of set active. And as a result, all the knowledges uh, gathered in the T1's active state must be transferred to uh, T2's uh, second uh, active state, for example, via release acquired synchronization. So that is basically the, the, the guarantee uh, that is imposed by this epoch consensus rule. Um, because they are, so by having a counterpositive uh, uh, statement of this, because they are, their epochs are differing by two, they are not concurrent. Or in other words, the, the, this active state must happen before uh, this active state. And as a result, uh, this removal should be observable or acknowledged in T2's t active state, uh, the second one. And as a result, B must not be uh, reachable from uh, this active state. This active state must not know the occurrence of the existence of the pointer B because it has already been removed from the data structure. 
So far so good. So there is a key difference between the epoch E plus 1 and E plus 2. E plus 1 may reference B and E plus 2 may should not reference the block B. And let's say we are in an active state, active state E plus 3. And suppose that we invoke the collect function inside this E plus 3. So this is very much possible because a collect function may be called arbitrarily by each thread. And let's say that it is, in, it is invoked inside an active state uh, that is annotated with E plus 3. And you can see that all the references that happens in active state E plus 1 or earlier, they should happen before this active state E plus 3. For the same reason that active state E plus 2 happens before uh, uh, happens after the active state E, and for the same reason uh, the active state E plus 3 must happen after all the active state E plus 1. And as a result, we can see that all the references to B they must happen before E plus 3. So all the, uh, in particular, all the D references to the B uh, must happen before the, the beginning of E plus 3 uh, active state. And furthermore, uh, in a concurrent thread, uh, for example here, all the concurrent threads must not reference the block B anymore because uh, their epoch must be at least E plus 2 uh, due to this consistency rule. So we have an epoch E plus 3, and as a result, all the concurrent threads must have an epoch uh, that is greater than or equal to E plus 2. And for the reason I just explained in uh, just before, uh, the, all the concurrent threads, for example, the epoch with the epoch E plus 2, they should not reference the block B. And all the references to the B must happen before the, the beginning of this E plus 3. And that's the reason why we can safely deallocate the block B in a collect function at uh, epoch E plus 3. Because all the reference, we just proved that. We somehow pictorially proved that all the reference to the block B must happen before the beginning of uh, the epoch E plus 3. And that's the reason why is it, it is safe to deallocate the, the block at the, the active state with epoch E plus 3. So at the, at, the, at, at the first glance, you may see that the C plus 3 is a very much, very much magical. The 3 is a very magic number. But you can now see that actually it, is, it has a reason. So the reason is this diagram. So you can now I believe that you can understand why the block B retired at E can be collected in uh, E plus 3 at, in this diagram and in more general in arbitrary execution. As far as this epoch consensus rule is satisfied by the, the, the older stress. Actually, there are many variants of this epoch-based reclamation, and in some variation, this number may differ. And the algorithm and the consensus rule may a little bit differ, and as a result, the rule can be uh, differ a little bit. But for now, let's assume that we are using this specific consensus rule and this specific rule, uh, rule for the free function. So. So as far as we are observing this consensus rule, E plus 3 is the right solution to uh, the, this question. And many other implementations may have different consensus rules uh, of the epoch-based reclamation, and they may have different criteria, but the essence is, essence is the same. So this diagram is the essence, and the essence of this algorithm is almost the same across all the implementations of epoch-based reclamations, and you don't need to worry about the the uh, the concrete uh, rules and the uh, rules of the other implementations. So, for now, let's assume that this is the canonical rule for EBR and the canonical uh, criteria for the epoch-based reclamation algorithm.
Okay, so far so good. So threads in overlapping at this step can now reference B, as I explained just before. And as a result, it is safe to free B in the collect function. Now, let me explain uh, the, the how easy it is to apply the epoch-based reclamation to uh, concurrent data structures. So recall that the hazard pointers needs to insert uh, a few a few in uh, in a few places uh, the the instructions for the safe memory reclamations. So, but uh, epoch-based reclamation is the same. We need to insert a few things, but arguably it is much more simple, much simpler than those for hazard pointers. So let me give you the concrete uh, things and then discuss that. Recall that the line 16 may be unsafe because uh, the concurrent pop function may already freed it at line 18. So in order to prevent such use after free, uh, which is the goal of every safe memory reclamation algorithm, we first insert the set active invocation between line 12 and 13. So uh, be, the, the line 13 is the beginning of the access to the concurrent memory locations. Line 12 doesn't, doesn't access the shared memory locations. So we can safely uh, s call the set active and at, after line 12. Uh, that says that, oh, I'm going to access the concurrent memory blocks. So I'd like to protect all the accesses that I'm going to do in a blanket manner. So that is by invoking the function set active. And the second change will be calling set crescent uh, at line uh, after line 20. So before line 20, uh, we are going to access the shared memory. So this is a loop. So maybe it is possible that after line 20, we go to line 13 and then 14 and access the a shared memory location. So only after line 20, we are quite sure that, oh, we finished the concurrent memory. So we can safely call set crescent, or we can get out of an active state. So that is basically uh, the very basic things we need to do for this uh, epoch-based reclamation. And furthermore, in the exactly same manner as in the hazard pointers, uh, we need to replace this free function with an retire. So recall that we should not immediately free the memory location because it may be concurrently accessed by the other threads. So instead of freeing this block, uh, blocker, uh, we need to retire it so that the epoch-based reclamation algorithm uh, later deal with this, uh, this intent to free. And actually this retire uh, request will be served by actually freeing this curve uh, only when it is guaranteed that all the other threads finished accessing the block B, uh, but I mean the block curve, as I explained in the previous slide using the epoch consensus. And that's all. That's the, all the changes we need to do for the, the EBR. So compare this with hazard pointers. In the hazard pointers, you need to protect each individual pointers before dereferencing it. And also, after protecting it, you need to make sure that that pointer is still residing in the concurrent memory. Otherwise, you need to go from the beginning. On the other hand, in this EBR implementation, it, it just marks the beginning and ending of the concurrent memory accesses, and you can just replace the invocations of free uh, with the invocations of retire. That's all. That is, the API of this EBR is much, much more simple than the API of the hazard pointers that required you to protect the individual pointers that you are going to dereference. And you need to also validate the, the protected pointers after calling the protect function. 
and it is difficult to do and actually it is very error prone and many errors may occur due to some missing protection or missing something but in in epoch based reclamation it is really really difficult to break the rule because you just need to mark the beginning and end of the concurrent axis and replace free with the tire that's all that is very easy to use and much and least much more easier to use than the hazard pointers so that is basically the the benefits of this epoch based reclamations however it has a very significant drawback or shortcoming. The, the shortcoming of this EBR is that it is not robust in the sense that if some of the stress are if some of the stress are hindering the reclamation, then then the deallocation or the free of these blocks may indefinitely delayed. So let me explain it by example. So let's assume that there are four threads that are maintained by an epoch-based reclamation and epoch consensus. And now suppose that B is uh, retired at an epoch, B, e, epoch E. And further assume that T3 is a very bad threat. It is very, very bad. And it is not, not quitting its active state. And it is Continue, continuing to access the shared memory without uh, bothered with the other threads. And if it is the case, we cannot advance the block epoch to the, 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 the bigger values. And all the later threads must have been uh, annotated with an epoch E plus 2 or less. The reason is that E, e plus 1 is on and on and on. It doesn't finish at all. So all the later threads are overlapping with this T3 uh, E plus 1. And as a result, uh, by the epoch consensus rule, uh, the, all the later stress epoch uh, must be less than or equal to E plus 2. And recall that the block B may be deallocated at an epoch E plus 3 for the reason that I explained in the previous slides. But at this point of time, B cannot be reclaimed indefinitely because of this T3 because epoch cannot advance to E plus 3 due to the, the T3's active state with epoch E plus 1. So B cannot be reclaimed at all even though it is retired earlier. So even after hours and days and even years, this block B cannot be reclaimed because of this bad threat T3. In that sense, this is not robust. A bad thread may uh, block the deallocation of all the block, all the memory blocks indefinitely. So T3 may effectively be um, offend or attack the the entire system. A single thread may uh, attack the entire system by not calling sequestrant. So that, in that sense, that is not robust. So the header pointers and epoch has a, a serious uh, trade-off. So, so, so this uh, this slide illustrates that. So recall that S SMR algorithms uh, are roughly classified into these two categories: header pointers and epoch-based collimation. And as I explained just before, hedger pointers is uh, slow and it is not applicable to many uh, many uh, patterns of synchronization. On the other end, epoch-based reclamation is not robust, so they are, are having uh, two uh, the, the distinct characteristics, and there's uh, distinct uh, shortcomings. And I said in a previous video that there are many descendants of these two algorithms and many of them are actually hybrid of those two. And however, none of the none of the uh, proposed uh, the algorithms satisfy uh, all the desired properties at the same time. For example, uh, this class of uh, algorithms are not compact in the sense that they should annotate all the memory allocations with some value. And 
as and as a result, they may increase the size of the memory allocate the, the size of allocated memory significantly. And some of them are utilizing the hardware or operating system specific features, and as a result, they are not that portable. And some of them are uh, some of them are not applicable to as well, and some of them are not robust. So the problem is that so the hazard pointers and epoch based reclamations they have distinctive shortcomings. And as far as I know, all the descendants of these uh, two algorithms that has been proposed so far uh, share the same shortcomings or they are having a different shortcomings. Uh, so none of the proposed techniques or algorithms satisfy all the desired properties at the same time. And this is a, a brief, a very brief uh, advertisement of this lab laboratory. And in this year, uh, we propose what is called a pointer and epoch-based reclamation, uh, which satisfies all the properties at the same time. It is uh, fast and widely applicable as in epoch-based reclamation. And at the same time, it is robust as in the hazard pointers. And furthermore, it is uh, very compact in the sense that it doesn't increase the memory usage at all. And it is self-contained. And as a result, it is very portable, and it can be uh, can, can be applied to many platforms and even embedded systems as well. So, uh, so that is basically what uh, Jae Wang and I did for uh, last year and this year, and it has been published in uh, this P uh, what is called the PLDI conference. So. Unfortunately, in this course and in this semester, we cannot go into deeper uh, aspects of this PBR uh, because it is a little bit more complicated than the, the even the, the both hazard pointers and epoch-based reclamation. And yeah, if you are interested, you can watch uh, the Jae Huang's uh, talk uh, at PLDI 2020. And it will explain a bit, a little, little bit about the implementation details and algorithmic details of this algorithm. So, and unfortunately, we we should stop here, and and hopefully you learn the algorithms of hazard pointers and epoch-based reclamation as well, uh, because they are the most basic and the oldest algorithms of uh, for safe memory reclamations.